Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Vinrika Sophia. I hope I've got that right. It's, it's, it's the first time trying that name. Um, joining us from the Netherlands today, right? That's correct. Welcome. How do you describe yourself? I like to call myself an intimacy activist. <laughs> intimacy activist. I knew this was going to be about sexuality and kink and tantra yeah. and non-monogamy and cuddling. I've, I've sort of heard that, you know, people get quite delicate about what they're called in this space. So I thought I'd just let you, you know, say it for yourself. Um, mm-hmm. How did you get interested in the body, Bilrika? How did you get interested in this? <laughs> I guess because I always used to be so shy and insecure. Like I really had super bad self-esteem, really bad. Um, I felt really bad about my body. I was never touched. I was barely ever touched when I grew up, like very little, um, not with my friends. And I had my horses around me. My, my horses were like my dear friends. But, uh, you know, uh, at some point. Uh, well, Sorry. You're a horse girl, okay. Yes, totally. So you can see the unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, we're, gonna, we're not going to be friends. So give us the geography here. You're growing up where? What age is this? Give us a bit more of a sense of this. I was, I was born in 83, so in the 80s, I guess, in the Netherlands, in a small village, a bit conservative village. Um, um, I had to bike to school for like 15 kilometers, like one hour to school. That was quite posh. Okay, posh okay. kids. And they didn't like me very much. So I was uh-huh. a bit bullied. I was a bit lonely. And yeah, that, that's how I grew up. Yeah, I was very mm. much outcast. Yeah. Mm. I was hanging out with okay. the goths. <laughs> got it. Got it. Okay. My wife was a goth and I kind of used to work. I went for a black eye on stage so I can relate to that. Yeah. And what was your sort of interest then? What, where did, was it tantra? Was it yoga? I mean, what was your first doorway not to? At time, not at the time. At the time, it was just horses. <laughs> but then, I never I, understood the horse yeah, thing. never understood much, it. And I actually didn't study touch either. I studied forest and trees. Like I've got a master degree in ecology, which is something ecology. completely different. Okay. But Free then growing up, got it. Growing up, I was um, I was having a job that I didn't like. I quit. You know, I had, I had a few babies. <laughs> I'm a mum, and at some point, I met one of my uh, one, a person who inspired me a lot. Uh, his name is Steve Bavlina. He's an American writer, and he sure, came yeah, over yeah. to yeah he came over to Europe, and I met him, and he dragged me on stage to do a cuddle demo in his lecture, and afterwards, like we hung out for a week, and then he said. Rilika, you got to do something with this. Like these cuddles of yours are magic. You can make money with them. And it, it took me time. <laughs> it took me time. But then at some point I was like, you know what? Let's try it. And that's how the first ever cuddle workshop happened. And the rest is history, basically. The more and more people came. And then I decided like, hey, I can actually really make this my, my, my living. And then so cuddles, know, cuddles and cuddle workshop became your thing. Yeah, that was how it started. And then it brought in, like, at the same time, like, as a parallel path, I wanted to do, like, I started to meet people who were doing Tantra. Like, some I just, it was the same time I was also opening the relationship I had at the time. So I started opening up to meet people, and I started meeting people who were into Tantra, who were into kink. And um, I was like, you know what, I actually want to do some workshops in this. But I didn't have the money. So at some point, I, I love networking. I love hanging out with people. I love meeting people. So at some point I managed to get some international Tantra teacher to the Netherlands and ending up being his organizer and assistant. So I went to Tantra workshops, making money with it. Uh, and that's how it started. So I went to more and more workshops, made some money. I could go to other workshops, being a mom at the same time and took my cutter workshops. Okay. Okay. I mean, cuddles is interesting. And I just met someone in the park today who hadn't had a hug from anyone except her boyfriend in three months. And that just, just before this call, you know, there's this sort of weird environment around touch now. I don't know what the situation now is in the Netherlands, but it's, we're just sort of opening up from the kind of COVID lockdown here in the UK now. Yeah. What, what's your thoughts on sort of why, why cuddles matter? Why is that a thing? I mean, why is there workshops on that? You know, like, go say more about that. 
Yeah, there's, there's so much to say about it. There's more and more research on the benefits of cuddling. But I think the main one is it is such a good antidote to stress. You know, there's so much stress in our in our world on a daily basis. You know, this is a society that's very much like thriving off stress, like always pushing. We need to earn more, do more. There's always more, more, more. So we're a lot in our, you know, our nervous system is activated a lot of the time. And we're in our fight, flight, whatever kind of reaction. There's a lot of stress and all these adrenaline hormones that come with that. And what cuddling does is that it really... Uh, it releases, of course, oxytocin, dopamine. You know, these these hormones are kind of like the 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 opposite of all the adrenaline. And other than that, it's like regulating, co-regulating nervous systems. So you breathe together, you calm down. And other than that, it's uh, it's lowering blood pressure, it's lowering your heart rate, it's boosting your immune system. Many other, many other. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Of cuddling. Yeah. So, so loads of benefits, and that, that kind of makes sense, I think, sort of the science now backs up our intuition. Oh, yeah. And obviously there's been a global conspiracy to keep us all apart of late. But it's, um, you know, that, that's it's a pretty essential human need. And I really worried when the sort of COVID yeah. rules came in. I was like, I don't think you understand. You're banning a human need that's a really yeah. important need. It's not, it's not nice to have. This is a core part of, you know, the Romanian orphans are a good example, aren't they? What happens to people when they don't get yes. touched? Sadly, yes, they, they got um, sick. They got they died in the end. Like they all got very pathetic. Like they they shut down. They just gave up on life, basically, and they mm, died. Mm, mm. Yeah. It's almost like touch reminds us that we're alive and that we're in community and that we're valuable and worthwhile and all those sort of things. But not on a cognitive yeah. level, but a visceral reminder. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but also on a physical level, like it's on all levels, it's it's uh, touch is super important. And I also, you know, I also want to stress, like, of course, now with COVID, there's a lot of people who don't get touched in the way they want to. But in my practice, when I do one on one sessions, I have outside of COVID, I have people who haven't been touched by anyone else than their doctor for sometimes 20 years, wow. like 10 years wow. or 20 years. And then they come and I'll just put a hand on them or hold them or let them hold me. And it's amazing. It's, it's heartbreaking, really, how much loneliness there is all the time. Not just now, but yeah, all yeah, the time. Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I, there's, there's different demographics. There aren't those elderly people that may have no touch. There's men who can't get touch unless they're fighting or fucking, you know. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely differences in different demographics in terms of who has... Uh, there's, there's a certain touch privilege that I think women have, for example, that most men don't in our society. Yeah, uh, in, in our society, you know, Western culture, for sure. Yeah, so, for sure. Uh, it's, there's, there's differences, aren't there? And you, you've done sort of whole TED Talks and things on this now. Like, what, what, what is it like to be like a touch expert? Like, it's kind of a fucking weird thing to be an expert in, right? Like, like what is it like to be like, oh, she's the, the hug lady, you know? It's well, like, I can uh, tell you that? That, that that inner shy part of me that I just told you about, she's still there, and she's often looking around, and she's like, what the fuck? Everyone likes me now. I'm the popular girl. I never was the popular. This is so weird. So it's mainly, it's, um, it's, it's almost surreal to become an expert in something that you kind yeah. of like choose that you're like, you know what, this is what, this is what's interesting to me. This is what helps me grow as a person. This is what, you know, makes me thrive. And then suddenly there's people looking at you be like, Hey, come and speak on our stage. Hey, come do a workshop. Hey, come on my podcast. It's, 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 it's kind of surreal actually. I actually didn't recognize you because I'd had you recommended by a few people and um, I came straight into this call from, supporting someone that needs some support one of my mentees and I kind of normally I'm kind of spending 10 minutes before the call kind of looking at someone's website reminding myself who I'm talking to because a lot of podcasts and I kind of forget so I always remind myself and and I came onto this call and I was like okay kind of Dutch name and then I was like who is this person and I, and I was like I kind of I didn't really recognize you even though I'd done quite a lot of research on you and I've you know this is the picture I've seen of you you know on the stage with the microphone Hi. with the black dress and you know looking really like hey I'm an American TED talker kind of vibe and I'm super confident and it's like, oh, I'm trying to like match that with this kind of person I'm meeting now. And it's making sense, like what you're telling me about your past and yeah. it's kind of making sense because you were really recommended by quite a lot of people to me. So I've seen this awesome. image of you many times and I've gone, okay, I did this name. Once a name kept comes up like three or four times, I'm like, okay, we'll get them on the podcast. But I, I somehow hadn't made that yeah. connection when I met you because it was a different, different vibe there from what I'd seen in the sort of on stage presence, you know? I've got many different faces. <laughs> no, no one must be put in a box, least of all women. Yeah. Mm. 
opening up, you mentioned open relationships. This is something that's still pretty taboo, that's becoming more common. Yeah. Um, maybe people have heard of polyamory or open relationships or, you know, there's various variations of that. Some people might think that it's uh, the same as some sort of 60s free love and other people <laughs> might, you know, they might have some sort of misconceptions about that. So is yeah. that something you want to talk about? Always. Yeah. It's always, Go for it. It's, what is it? What is polyamory, open relationships? What is that for people that don't know what that is? It's to me, it's everything that's outside of the normal, the normal monogamous paradigm of relating. So for some people, the practice of that is that you go and go to a kinky party with your partner every now and then. That could be open relating. Uh, for other people, it's having having five or six relationships at a time. For others, it's going to swingers parties. For others, it's having an extra boyfriend or sharing a girlfriend or whatever. You know, it can be the thing with open relating or non, I like to call it non-monogamy because like both polyamory and open relating have some stigma around it. Um, it's uh, like as soon as you leave the, the, the book of non, of monogamy, okay. then there is no book anymore. Then right. there is no right. rules anymore. Then there's Where? endless varieties and ways. Yeah, to- yeah. 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 Because that's very different, you know, just sort of both people being open, having you know, many lovers as opposed to sharing a girlfriend. Like that's a very different situation. And, yeah. you know, in terms of what are the rules are, the communication rules and the safe sex rules and how people orientate that around children and, you know, like all the different sort of things in people's lives. There's very much many kind of constellations, I think they call them. Really. And in yeah. a way, monogamy is fucking strange. Like, there's no <laughs> other situation. I mean, it really is fucking weird. There's no other situation in life where we go, like imagine if we did this with friends. Okay, Vilka, we're friends now. You can have no other friends. I am your only friend. You will only do friending things with me. That would be kind of like controlling and weird, right? Mm-hmm. And often I've noticed people often put a kind of hygiene exterior on this, like it's about pregnancy or social STIs or something. But that's not really what's going on. Underneath that is the core moral narrative of our secular culture, which has made monogamous romantic love the core mythos of our culture so mm-hmm. it's deeply taboo to go against that that's my experience mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, totally so totally just agree i so totally disagree with you. Think that. Add it's, something. It's, come on it's right it's right we have been kind of programmed and some say by the church some say by i don't know politics whatever to uh but it's 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 the wiring in our brain is that we relate with one person and, you know, you, you make the parallel with friends. You can also make the parallel with streams of income. You know, I want abundance in my life. I want a lot of money. Then yeah. you go and create different sources where it comes from. So yeah. if I, as a person, want a lot of love and a lot of beautiful sex in my life, I'm going to focus it on one person and one person only. You have to meet all my needs now. Touch, yeah. love, intimacy, connection, sex, no matter yeah. where you are in your cycle, no matter where you are in your life, no matter where I'm at, no matter, no, none of that. It all has to come from you or else you're a bad person. Exactly. But it's a lot of pressure, isn't it? It's kind of weird, it's right? Pressure. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Fucking hell. There is a lot of pressure. We do put a lot of pressure on the partners that we have. And yeah, and, and yeah, on the one hand, it's taboo, taboo that, that can um, keep us into the monogamy paradigm. And on the other hand, uh, you know, non monogamy is not for the faint of heart. It is terrifying. It's scary because it's not just going against the grain, it's not just dealing with the judgments of people around us, but it's also dealing with our own fear. Because, you know, when Insecurity. insecurities, because of this, probably the same programming of our brain, when the person we love has sex with another person, there will be a lot of, you know, past um, uh, how conditionings and stuff that will tell us like, now they don't love us anymore. So when we go into open relating, like... But that's, that's the female version. The male version is, I want to fucking kill that guy. It's a little bit different. Oh, yeah. But it's, <laughs> but it's, 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 but it's, <laughs> it's maybe a slightly different flavor. But there's definitely stuff that comes up emotionally that's pretty yeah. confronting. Right? And you have to want that. Like, it's not... A lot of people think, okay, open relating means a lot of sex with a lot of people. Yay. Um, that's, that's definitely not... That's, that should not be your motivation because it's not going to be that easy. <laughs> <laughs> and there needs to be the communication, there needs to be the emotional work. I mean, the communication is a big part of it as well, right? Being at a say, hey, actually, this is a line for me, you know, that you don't don't go with my friends, you know, is that a deal we can arrange, you know? Like there's, there's lines there, aren't there, in terms of where the boundaries are for different, because it's not given. If you think about it, it's almost like society gives us roles. And now we're, we're the almost, monogamy is almost the last one. 
you know, we've lost gender roles, we've lost work roles. You know, in the past, my ancestors would have just done the job of their, you know, the one before them. You know, if your dad was a blacksmith, you're a blacksmith. We've lost roles in, in, in you know, king or country. You know, we don't, we don't, we've lost roles in our village because we don't really live in those villages anymore like you yeah. and I grew up in. So it's like we have to make all these choices and that's really tiring and stressful. But at least at the middle of all that, there's still monogamous romantic love. So yeah. it's like, do you really want to make that into a choice? Because it's sort of easier just to go along with what's given. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to arrange it. It's well, just it's a presented yeah. as a template to you, right? Yeah, but you can still make that choice. Like what I, what I really like, like I am definitely not a non-monogamy missionary or something. Like I'm definitely the last person who would say like we all no, should We have... don't believe in the missionary on this show. We don't believe in the missionary <laughs> in any way. That's, that's, that's crazy yeah. talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but, yeah. So you know, you're not trying to convert people. No, I'm not trying to convince people about anything at yeah, yeah, all. Yeah. And the only yeah. thing I like to do, like if 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 I can support someone making a conscious choice, then my yeah. job is done. So if someone okay. says, you know what, I want to be in monogamy because that's my empowered choice, then right. go, you know, beautiful. Awareness and choice. That's, wow, that works for me. This is what I want to choose. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes I, I, I just sometimes I just get judgmental about it just for fun, just to fuck with people. You know, I say, listen, you're sexual anorexic, you're weird, control freak, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> just like, just kind of, kind of, kind of, just literally just go right into like hardcore judgmentalism in the same oh, yeah. way as you can receive back the other way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, it's, and it's just for the fuck, just for the fuck of it, just to go, look, I can make a case that you're as sick as you're saying non-monogamous people are sick. And it's like, but if I was to play devil's advocate, you know, often a case I sometimes hear is something like, but then your partner will get lost less love because you're spreading your love around. Or yes, the, the spiritual version of that is something like, oh, you're not forced to confront the spiritual growth of being with your partner. And I think this is a genuine risk, actually, because you can just do a side thing and then you don't have to do that process with your partner. Mm. right how would you respond to the sort of zero-sum love argument and the um the sort of argument of it's not not because i have said sort of spiritual people say well it's not really spiritual because you're not in that growth relationship in the same way oh yeah 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 well some spiritual people say love is limitless like there's ab abundance of love there is no end to love like you know and I, I agree with that to some point you know i've got three children and I love my first kid so much. And then, you you know, as when you have your first baby, you think you'll never be able to love someone else that much. And then the second kid comes and you love him just as much. So I do believe less, that we can... A bit less, a minute. A bit less. I want this oh, to be no. on record. <laughs> Live with it. Live with it. Live with it. 20 years not. time your kids are gonna have therapy when they catch this podcast a little bit less a minute because of you probably then <laughs> <laughs> i'll pay for that therapy session 20 years from now so okay so sorry limitless love kids yeah, no, I, I do believe that we can, can yeah. that we can absolutely love multiple people on a, in a very deep way and mm -hmm. you know time is limited so yes when i ha i True. see different people there is you know at the end of the line there is there's less time per person um, right. So that's you have so many friends too, right? That's yeah. a choice yeah. I make. If I spend all my time with one person, um, at some point I get a bit bored. You know, it's more. It's not about quantity to mm. me. It's more about quality. And at the same yeah. time, you know, but let's be honest. I've been in a monogamous relationship for the past six months. It just ended. But I've been in a monogamous thing for the last six months. It was great. It was great. Give my nervous system a bit of a break of all the communication because there is a lot of communication. Less choices. Right it's kind of nice for a while, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. it's kind of nice for a while. Years. And then my, then my, my system well, well. was like, oh, come on, where's, where, where is, where is adventure? <laughs> Uh huh. No, well, people, the, norm, the other things I often hear are, but don't you catch loads of diseases? And it's like, well, no, because you can still practice safe I've, sex. And not. I, that's you know. what I want to say. I've, 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 I've had my adventures. Let's say it that way. I've never ever had an SDI yet. I may get one, but I've never had one. I've had partners who I was their second partner and they had an SDI. So it's not right. in the numbers. But this, you saw my argument is statistics that you're increasing your chances, right? I mean, you of are increasing you are. your chances with, of you know, course numbers. You are, but if you, if you go out of your house, you increase your chances of getting the flu, you know, it's, it's, it's what happens. Sure. And yeah, yeah. Um, I'm all pro uh, mindfulness and, and informed choice is what I call it. So I, my, my personal role is before I t anyone takes their underwear off, we're going to have a talk. And a talk oh, right now got oh, very boring, sexy. Boring, it's boring, boring, conscious oh, woman. No. Let's have a long conversation about it. It's, oh, so boring. Doesn't that just take all the fun out of it? 
It does not. It does not because it shows that I'm a responsible person. It shows was that I responsible care. around sex. Oh, You're come on. With me now. Such a grown up. Oh my God. This is like boring. Yeah. Or I'm the spiritual or the spiritual version of that. I don't need testing because I don't catch anything. I'll just, you know, get people it out of my aura. People, people say, say that. that. Oh yeah, there is there's very tantric people who say like I never get STIs and I also never fuck with a condom because I can't feel anything through it. You know, that's that's, that's the, the quickest way to turn me off. <laughs> that's that, fucking yeah. Retarded. It is. I'm and sorry that's, to be judgmental, that's, but that is no, but that's sorry. also why I have those talks, Mark. That's wow. why I ask people, to like, what out? do you usually use when you, when you fuck someone? What, what precautions do you use? When were you tested? I and get my second question I can ask question you in a very sexy way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that, that's worth flagging. I mean, I see your logic there. That's definitely worth flagging. And that would be, like, a bit like, ah, uh, no, nah, I'm not. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, Hi, so that's you interesting. You don't meditate. I don't do that. No, <laughs> no enjoy. But your, I want to know what risks I'm taking, you know? I care about my body. And I, I want to know what risks I'm taking. So I want to know if before I get into bed with someone or wherever we're going to have sex, I want to know what risks I'm taking. If you're fucking around with everyone without using any precautions, I'm probably not going to fuck you. You know, we need, sure. I need to know that. Um, it's very matter of fact. There's some cultural stuff in here too. But it's, um, okay, okay. Let's talk about kink. So I had my friend Melissa on the show yesterday. Who do you know, Melissa? She's a sort of Berlin scene, yes. kink scene. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. old friend. So she was on talking about kink. We always have a good time. And um, let let in case people miss that one. You know, what is kink, and why is it not just a sign of pathology? <laughs> wow, that's a big question. What is kink? Kink is again. It's pretty much everything outside of what's perceived normal. It's like what is not standard routine in bed everything outside of that could be kink you know it can be fantasies can be kinky uh using gloves like these rough gloves or soft gloves to touch someone can be kinky having sex outside or in your car could be kinky. It can be anything having it's monogamous not- sex in a missionary position with the lights off that's yeah, pretty kinky. much the opposite of that <laughs> <laughs> what's the kinkiest thing you've ever done that you're willing to admit oh my God, to really? on a public it's a public podcast. This is recorded. Yeah. Your mum might see it. Your children are going to see it. My kids might listen to us when they grow so up. Given that, what is the kinkiest thing? You're willing, and I'm not going to admit anything, just for the record. So um, what, what, are you, what are you willing to admit to? Is there any particular fun ones? There is there's a whole list. So I have, to think, I have to think about which one I would want to share. Which but one I you want to share? One, I remember. You're going to edit it out. Don't email me afterwards asking to edit it out. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one of the, one one very uh, kinky thing I once did was uh, uh, being sexy in a sauna. You know these steam cabins; they cannot film anything because of the steam. And I was I was having a little bit of fun with my lover and his slave. And uh, if you lover and his slave. Yes, yes. Got it. Yes, yes. Got it. Okay. We were having, we were just having that, like everyone's got a slave. That's just normal. <laughs> We had a bit of sexy interaction going on and then suddenly two people came into that steam cabin and we were like, oh, nothing happened. And they were like, yeah, there was, but please continue. And we were like, okay. <laughs> so they just had their sauna while you three are going for it? Sorry? They just continued. Was this in the Netherlands? Oh, yeah. In a regular sauna. Oh, excellent. So that was, that excellent. was fun. You know, and another thing that might be probably very kinky is just, you know, when I, when I, one of the things I do for a living is have play parties. I'll dress up in my own sexy attire. You want to say what a play party is because not everyone will know that. Uh, play, yes, of course. A play party is like kind of like a guided space, like a space that's held. So there is someone having an overview, doing an introductory workshop and such. Um, and then you can do whatever you want within the space that's designed. So in my, my play parties are sexy. So people can have sex in them. They can do, um, they can, they can do tantric things. They can do kinky things. It's all fine. And then me and my team, we will also dress up in our kinky things, whatever that looks like. And then I'm there in my, my, my fetish clothes, just looking at everything and just watching it and just standing there dancing in the middle and seeing people sex do party. sexy things <laughs> to me that is very kinky and i love it <laughs> awesome why as embodiment you know embodiment podcast right like why might we be interested in king i mean you know because one one thing here i don't think there's too many conservatives listening saying oh you're sick and weird i think a lot of people might be listening though and saying okay cool that's your business you're uh-huh. into sort of sex that's cool 
you know, marks into dolphins. Great, whatever. You know, that's your business. You know, as long as the dolphin's consenting, it's all good. And like, I think that's kind of a pretty normal view amongst my liberal friends. But it might be like too much information. I don't know. But why might embodiment people be interested in this topic? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, to I can I can tell you what it brought me in terms of embodiment is that. Um, Again, I used to be very shy. I was not a person taking a lead. And, you know, people can tell you how to do that. Uh, like step in front of groups, go practice speaking, uh, do this, do that, tell people what to do, you know, in a consensual way. But when people tell me that, I don't feel it in my body. And my belief is that I need to do it and feel it in my body before it really reprograms my brain. Great. And and King, one of the profound, most profound things for me, and I've seen happen a lot with, with other people, is that that moment that someone put me in this dominant leading role over someone, um, I was stepping into this, we can call it this archetype or this inner, mm -hmm. you know, tapping into this part where I can actually be that, or you can even call it role play. When I step into that role of leading someone, and I've actually become that person, then I get this embodied imprint of like, okay, mm. this is what it's like to take lead. And you know right. what? It's not that scary. It wasn't for a few seconds, but it's not, and it was so much fun. And then I started to feel the fun in leading uh, and also in consciously letting someone else lead. And it, it changed everything. I mean, I, I, get, I mean, basically you just made a very good argument for why embodiment is important. I think it's a very eloquent, concise argument for why embodiment. We have to step into things physically, not just read the books on them. Oh, yeah. You know, but you could step into the role of a military general or an airplane pilot just as, why make that sexual? What, what, is that, what does that add to it? Oh, I just want to say that kink is not necessarily sexual. Like most oh. of the, the best kink scenes I've done are not necessarily sexual. So I can keep my clothes on and have a very kinky sexy ses session with someone. So it doesn't have to be sexual. Um, many paths lead to Rome, you know, I just happen to love the kinky one. So uh -huh. if, if your path is that one of that general and it works for you, then, then great. And uh, I just happen to go through this one. It can make deep personal growth work fun. Quick break from the interview to tell you about our shop and a deal we've got on there and also about some events that are coming up. So if you go to embodied facilitator slash shop and use the code, use the code podcast, podcast 50, podcast 50, podcast 50 is the code. You can get 50% off, 50% off anything in the shop. And what have we got on there? How to design training, trauma for facilitators, breath work leadership resilience uh, life purpose there's a bunch of books there's a bunch of e-courses mostly for facilitators trainers coaches yogis different ebooks but that code will give you 50 percent out of anything at all there in the shop so that could save you let's see up to 100 pounds which is about 120 dollars so well worth having that code go to embodiedfacilitator.com slash shop also on that website you will see embodiedfacilitator.com slash events dash calendar just look under events under the main title you'll see all the stuff we've got coming up for events we regularly have free online events if you're interested in embodiment we have them on coaching life purpose marketing or trauma all sorts of things so have a look at the events page you can see the different one day events we've got coming up related to the conference and all kinds of other stuff okay so all of that is on embodiedfacilitator.com and remember that code there that code is podcast 50 if you want 50 percent off anything there you go a good deal back to the interview i mean if someone said to me you know hey you want to learn you know to submissive role you know do you want to do that you know with a hot girl and leather or do you want to do that in, an, in a boring way i'd go i'm gonna go for option a like that that is a more interesting way to learn anything surely i mean it's it's motivating it's interesting it's engaging if nothing else yeah there's so much pleasure in it there's so much fun in it there's so much fun in spanking someone's butt and making that consensual, joyful experience. And other than that, like even with this, the, the, the spanking example, um, there, it's all, also a beautiful modality to heal trauma. So there's... Yeah, I was going to ask about that, the sort of potential for both trauma healing and trauma uh, sort of, um, what would be the word, um, reenactment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's say yeah. a bit more about the relationship between kink and trauma. Well, we many of us have pretty much everyone has experiences in their life where their power was taken away uh, or where someone was overpowering in an, them in a non-consensual way. And what you can do with kink is, is kind of like you say, like reenacted, but then consensually and maybe with a different outcome. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe you have, you have trauma where someone like overpowered you physically and you reenacted in a way where you, 
uh, you know, throw them off of you or where Paul you Linden's are the one. Trauma work is explicitly that. I mean, that's Paul Linden's explicit trauma work around self-defense. He's a martial wow. arts teacher and he will, you know, yeah. that's essentially what he does is he sets up situations where someone is being attacked and then gives them a different outcome. And yeah. it's profoundly healing for people. But that doesn't necessarily yeah. organize in that way in a, in a sort of kink scene, is it? Some, sometimes it is. There are workshops and places where we actually set this up or people with each other, like really as a, as a like the kink world, like one of the stigma is that it's, it's a violent world. Well, it's one of the most loving, if not the most loving. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Lovely people, just really consent yeah. boundaries and sweet and yeah. just very pleasant. My experience, a, lot of, just, a lot of consent work that's now uh, touching the bigger audience comes right. From- kick came first, right? I, I came across kick and I was like, wow, this is so much better than yoga. Yoga is really abusive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yoga people need to spank each other a bit more. So, yeah. Yeah. But also in other ways, for example, um, if you have been humiliated or uh, verbally abused, you could set that up where someone is actually saying those things to you and you just hear them again and again and again until the charge is completely gone and you can release it. You can release it. Sometimes it helps when it's stuck, you know, when it's in a part of your brain that you cannot access. Uh, I've had sessions where I was dominating a person and just spanking them while saying something to them so that they could break through these walls that are like keeping them away from healing. Like the trauma would have such a wall around it that you would like literally have to um, consensually use impact to, to get through to that. And then they can release the emotion. And now they're just dying inside and writing angry letters. And I mean, it's potentially quite delicate work you're talking about here, huh? It's super delicate work because as, as when you are dominating someone who's going into this emotional processes, you have to be so precise, like knowing when to stop your hand in the air and to take it back and breathe and then guide them into like letting go of these old emotions that are still stored in the system. And often it, it, it such scenes and often in an emotional release of anger and sadness. And then at the end, it's like people shed a load of, of weight. You know, all this weight that they carried with them, they can like finally release it. What do you think is the relationship between how people are in the rest of life and their kink? So, you know, there's these stereotypes like, you know, the submissive secretary who becomes the dominatrix or the <laughs> dominant businessman who becomes wants to be dressed up as a little baby, you know. And I, I've seen a little bit of that in myself, but as I've become more sort of powerful and successful, I've sort of seen the other side of things as a bit more attractive because it's just like, oh, I just want to turn off. And that was not no. normally my mode, you know, I don't reveal too much here, but it's like, it's been like, okay, like now I see both sides as having a place, you know, yeah. and it's, um, I, I, what, what's your take? Is it compensatory? Because I've also had sexual partners who were just exactly like they were in real life in bed. There was yeah. no compensation, no balancing. It was just, they were them, but maybe more so, you know? And then that's kind of like, I would guess like most of the dominant guys I know are kind of probably a bit dominant in life generally, you know, high testosterone, high achievement kind of people. So what do you sense is the correlation? Because you've probably got a bit of some bigger sample size than I have. Yeah, well, it's pretty much like you say, like there, there, there's the people who are in a similar flavor all the time. And there's people who compensate. It's, 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 it's exactly as you say. Sometimes they switch, sometimes they, they don't. And, and there are more submissive people than true dominant people in the world there's there more, more submissive. submissive people yeah there's more submissive people if you take a general population like the real like real authentic more people are submissive than there are dominant why is that i don't know i well i do know actually there is it's you know as as as, as a society you don't need that many leaders you just need a few. Right. You need a few good leaders, and you need a whole lot of people who can follow that leaders in in different yep. ways to have a functioning yeah, yeah. society. And it's the same, you know, like the real authentic dominate dominating people, dominance. Uh, there's there's fewer of them. Mm. And then I'm and not meaning the ones who abuse their power or who like act sure, sure, in something sure, that sure. which is not authentic. Yeah, and what you know, I've got I've I've had partners in the past who were kind of guilty about being submissive. They were like. I'm a modern feminist Dutch woman, you know, yeah. I shouldn't be submissive. And, you know, like they, they had a narrative that like, and when they let that go, they just enjoyed themselves so much more. Yeah. And others who just won't ever let it go. I've come across cause it's just, yeah. it feels like politically guilty or something for them. Uh, and I've, I've also met kind of new age hippie guys who also weren't able to accept their like dominance as well. But it's like generally depending on the culture, subculture, 
you know, like conventional people, it's going to be men one way, women the other, and then that's flipped for less conventional people, less conventional subcultures. Do you come across people who have that, like, guilt of their sexual well, type? Yeah, a lot. And it's one of the things I'm passionate about is to support people to let that shame go. But, you know, honestly, looking from more general perspective of society, there is no place on the kink spectrum that's accepted and not taboo. You know, dominant men are perpetrators, submissive men are sissies, dominant women are bitches and ruling, I don't know what, and, and submissive women are no, no feminist, you know? You know, there's, there is no positive place on that uh, area at the moment. You know, there's a lot of taboo on any... Oh, God, you know, right? I mean, the Netherlands is not England and hippie communities are changes. I mean, oh, I mean yeah, just like oh, yeah. grief as a dominant man, just dominant in my manner, I get more grief in a Buddhist center than I ever will do in a business right <laughs> just yeah. like there's a context there of course yeah of course this was very much generalizing of course yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. cool what else are you passionate about about in this topic like why is this your thing what is the thing you go you know we want the whole world to know this what i want well what important is to me is is to we don't get to practice touch and consent in a, in a normal world I wish we did. Like we learn in school, we learn how to, when it comes to sex, we learn how to not get pregnant, how to not get sick, right? That's right, right, right. That's the focus. Yeah, don't get a disease, don't get pregnant. And this is the biology yeah. of it. This is the Nobody name. tells you it can be fun. Nobody tells you it's okay. Nobody tells you it's a need to have intimacy. And intimacy to me is the full spectrum of, of being real with another person. So from, from eye gazing to touch, to cuddling, to sex and kink and everything. Like nobody's teaching us that. And, what I'm super passionate about is that we all get the opportunity to feel in our bodies what it means when I want something, when I have a desire, and that I get an embodied sense of when it's a boundary of when I don't want something related to intimacy. So we need spaces where we can practice that. We need spaces where someone tells us, okay, now stand in front of someone and feel what's happening now. If you come closer, what's happening then? If you go further away, what's happening then? And what does that mean for you? What are your signals? You know, I cannot tell you how your boundaries feel. I can tell you how mine feel. And by now I'm able to communicate them, which, which for a lot of people is super difficult. I know it has been for me. Um, so we need places. We really need places, not just places to touch each other. I, I do think we need them really, we really, really need them too. And we need places where we can practice, where we can practice intimacy where you can practice vocalizing, yeah, saying, just saying yes to someone, saying no to someone. Because how many of us haven't, you know, um, violated our own boundaries just because we couldn't say no? And if you've practiced that like 10 times, 20 times, 100 times, it's so much easier when it really matters. Sure, sure. It's like you need a dojo. You need a place where you can practice where there's yeah. no consequences, yeah. where there's controlled conditions and consenting partners who aren't going to abuse you, right? Yeah, like and some support. Some some people around you who are like neutral support. If you need, if mm. you need to to you know share about it or you know, yeah, mm. yeah. I would so want to change that in the world. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Mm. Anything else we haven't talked about that you'd love to dive, you know, touch upon There's before? So much. I can talk We've... endlessly about all these topics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm noticing I'm a little bit tired today, but I, I enjoy the subject and I like what you're saying. Hmm. What biggest misunderstanding around this topic you come across? That everything is about sex. Okay. Yeah. Like a lot of people cannot, like sometimes when people ask me, what do you do? And I say, I always cuddle workshops. You know, that's when yeah, I say yeah, yeah. schoolyard and stuff, uh, when I don't want to no. talk about the sexier things. And then people say, oh, but that's, that, those are orgies, aren't it? Like, no, it's not sexual mm -hmm. at all. Or um, sometimes people say, I don't do cuddle workshops. I'm more advanced than that. I only do when I can have sex with another person. You know, there's this yeah. hierarchy of touch uh, where, where where kissing is better than cuddling and fucking is better than kissing. Right, it's more advanced somehow. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's such a big misunderstanding. Like cuddling on its own is as worthy as sex is, you know? It's not one is not better than the other or more evolved than the other, however you want to say that. It's just a different flavor. And we have different needs in different moments with different people. This is what I say in my TED Talk too. It's like we, we have those different needs. And it doesn't mean that one is better. It doesn't mean that if I have sex with you, I like you better than when I cuddle you. It's just I, I have a different, you know, our connection expresses itself in a different way. Or, you know, the expression, this is the expression that fits this connection. 
doesn't mean, you know, eye contact, just these two seconds of a smile with a stranger on the street. It's worthy. It's, it's perfect. But that's, that could be enough for that moment. It doesn't mean that if I would have stood there for half an hour, it would have been better. You know, so this it, idea it I found eye contact not my idea of a good time. It's um, no, it's something I, I agree with that. Flavor. That's great, you know. I, I agree with that. Eye gazing. Yeah, they're <laughs> wrong. Um, so I agree with that. And there's something kind of f- that can be fake that's attached to this. Mm-hmm. Um, I particularly hear this from women. Um, okay. It's very big in the yoga world to say, well, this is not about sex when it's clearly sexualized that's clearly the carrot that's being dangled. That's why most of the men are in the room, if not the women. And <laughs> to, to watch the downward facing dogs from behind. Well, if not the yoga, but maybe it's the tantra workshop, you know, oh, it's yeah. like if you took away all the sex, then, you know, all the possibility of sex, then, you know, there'd be a lot less participants there. Yeah. And well, my, a- I, I want to challenge that because my cuddle workshops are strictly non-sexual and there are so many people coming to them. I'm not debating. I don't know your particular workshops or your particular crowd. Um, and I do think there are other needs other than sex, obviously. But what I'm trying to point to here, maybe, I'm sure you've seen this, is a fakeness. And this has been part of the evolutionary game between men and women for a long time. That men are slightly more interested in sex more of the time, in that sperm is cheap, pregnancy is expensive. Mm. So, and we're not cyclical in quite the same way. Yeah. And this is this in all animals that have a large and a small sex cell, this mm-hmm. is the case. Mm-hmm. Right? This is why normally it's the men who are doing the peacocking and the performing and you know, trying to kind of trying their best kind of thing, you know. Yeah. And I'm thinking out loud here, and it's quite delicate ter- territory, particularly in sort of, you know, 2020. Mm-hmm. But there's a way in which I see that game being played where it's in the women's best interest to deny things are sexual because mm-hmm. that means they can get maximum attention and male resources mm-hmm. um, without particularly in a monogamous environment, we'll have to sort of choose, you know, at some point. Um, you know, Queen Elizabeth played this off her entire life, you know, with the different suitors. And um, Elizabeth I, I should say, if the current queen is out there, I don't mean you, darling, okay? <laughs> so it's a historical fact. And the men, it's in their best interest to say it's not sexual. Mm. And I definitely see this in new age communities. They're like, hey, I just want to connect. I just want to cuddle. Mm. I just want to. And then it's like, you want to fucking get your dick wet. You know, you want to fuck. I know you do. Come on, be honest. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if I call people on this, like, oh, you're just projecting your own blah, blah, blah. So it's, so it's like, can we at least name that this... Oh, yeah. There's a denial of the actual sexuality of certain situations which benefits people. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not smart to go into a room and just be like, hey, I want to fuck a whole load of people here and I'm going to be completely upfront about that. That's a terrible strategy. As a man, to, a as a man ever, that was a terrible strategy. For a woman, that's a terrible strategy. Like, Again, like I would, I've been thrown out of events just for being like overtly sexual with people in a very, you know, respectful boundary. Again, world. I want to challenge you. Like, I think you're attractive. And I'd love to have sex with you. It's like that's that's harassment, right? Again, I want to so challenge. Like, I want to. I do want to challenge this. Like, I I agree with you fully. I agree with you on 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 the the difference in gender and 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 desires or you know evolution and all of that and I also agree with you on the fakeness and I can tell you from my experience in my personal life and what I've seen happening in my spaces is that when a man is super honest about his desire when he's like really authentic and really says you know what I actually he walks up to me and he says you know what I would love to fuck you and he's authentic and he's not hiding it he's not making it bigger it's just super authentic that to me is a turn on and I've seen so many women even when it's in a group and a man says you know what what we always share desires in these play parties. And then uh, someone may say, my desire, my wildest desire would be to have sex with five women tonight. And um, everyone feels the honesty in that. Like you really have to be honest, but when people can feel your honesty, that is so much more attractive than saying like, oh, I men, just want to come and like massage. Terrible advice, men. Don't listen to this. But, <laughs> so, Try so, it, but- be like, honest like, and authenticity be respectful. Is I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Authenticity is attractive. This is going to get men listening to this slapped, <laughs> sued, fired. And it's no, not going to get laid. Taking, you, know, because, you know, I'm not saying you cross anyone's boundaries because you don't get sued if you don't cross. If you're authentic uh, and just explain, this is my anymore. desire. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you don't cross people's boundaries particularly in the Netherlands, Germany and Sweden's place like that, it doesn't matter. 
just having those desires as a man and being honest about them is dangerous. You're showing massive female privilege by not realizing this. You're giving out massively dangerous advice I'm, to I'm men just, out there. Right? I'm just saying my experience, this is my experience. Of course, it's a different experience as a woman. It's totally different. Yeah. Are you bisexual? Slightly. Okay, a little bit. Okay, so probably less experience with women. Okay. Well, I, no do have, I do have a fair, fair bit of experience with women. But, but yeah. no experience as a man. <laughs> No, I mean, I, you don't, right? I don't know. I, I don't know what it's like to have a period or to give birth to a child. I'm not going to try and talk about that. Yeah. No. There's some pushing cool. back. I think I'm mostly agreeing with what you're saying and this beauty in what you're saying, and you know, the idea of touch being essential, and the idea of authenticity being offended, being able to authentically express our needs, and there has to be the container for that. And modern society is not yes. the container for that for men. That's no, what I'm I, I do agree with you. I do agree with you. It has to be the right container. So please, no, don't go scream everywhere. I want to fuck you. Like if you're <laughs> a construction worker in the street, I would scream. Imagine I walk down the street. You want to fuck? No, you fuck? I, you want to fuck? no. Yeah, no. I, no I do mean in the right container. And I do mean, you know, not in an offensive you, To be fair, you did say it before, didn't you? You did say we need these containers for yeah. places where people can do this. Yeah, where we can practice that. that. Yeah. Cool. A little tussle, a couple of dominants tussling. That's good. That's good. When we have become friends. <laughs> it's my whip. It's my whip. <laughs> yeah. We've got time for one more. We've got time for a quickie. One more. Any other subject that we haven't touched upon here? Oh, huh. we, we're going high speed. There's a lot of subjects we're touching here in very little Women time. Always want to slow <laughs> very efficient. Down. Yeah, always the tantra girls always want to slow things down we can get we anything at all we can come back to one of the topics if you prefer we can have a round two on one of those ones <sighs> let's terrible see interview. terrible interview <laughs> 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 we're used to professionals <sighs> you said a lot of interesting stuff i appreciate it Thank What's you. the work you most love doing? Is there like a thing that you most like really love teaching? Just like right now, you know, not this isn't like the CV that this isn't the elevator pitch of your work, right? Is there just yeah. something that's kind of hot for you right now? It it is the, the mixture of of kink with tantra, and tantra to me is most about presence. So if if you want to say it that way, it's about very present, conscious, uh, kinky dynamics. That is what I'm most passionate about because there's so much empowerment in that. Mm. Uh, that seems to be a leading edge. I think these worlds are colliding because kind of, you know, Melissa and I talked about this, that the kinks coming out of the shadows yeah. and Tantra are considered a bit more normal now. And it's like there's much, they can cross fertilize much more easily. You know, it's yeah. not like the kink crowd and the Tantra crowd and they have like secret societies and secret websites and secret <laughs> club nights. It's much more just like, oh yeah, I tried that at once at a festival. And oh yeah, my friend John is into that, you know? So it's, yeah. it seems like those two are cross fertilizing pretty well right now, particularly in the context, like everybody knows Stephen Porges and Peter Levine, you know, it's like, it's like in the context of trauma work that, that I think could be a pretty juicy kind of coming to fruition. So sort the of trauma meets Tantra meets kink. Cause a lot of Tantra has been very abusive and not Tantra. It's oh, yeah. more informal, yeah. Right. All the scandals, yeah. particularly we do. I was looking for a, like a Tantra teacher for me and my wife to go to. And someone just said, pick a woman, just pick a woman. <laughs> Any guy is going to be a fucking abusive twat. You know, like there, just, there are a few good ones, but yeah. You it's, recommend it's, a few? Who do you recommend? Who's good in the space out there? Who uh, we'll get? We'll obviously let you say your website in a bit, but who else is good in the space that you recommend? In the uh, in the tantra world, yeah, kink or tantra or kink that or whole you know, people have maybe listened to this, they're inspired. Yeah. They're like, well, in in the UK, there's Shani Love. Shani is amazing. Is it, is Shani it Love? Shani, yeah, Shani is amazing. He is very much trauma informed and consent friendly. So cool. I would say check him, definitely check him out. He's one of my favorites. Yeah. Globally, we have listeners in Scandinavia, oh, America, oh. Australia. In the Tantra field, I really like Shashi Saluna. She is very beautiful, beautiful Tao Tantric arts lineage work. So very old, old stuff she's teaching. Really good stuff. Um, I must say, I am very critical because, as you say, there's a lot of. Mm. Um, trauma and there's a lot of um, I am high I consent to me is really important so when a tantra workshop starts for me like uh, face someone make eye contact and then give them a hug I'm out of the room I'm out of the room I don't want that 
I want to have my empowered a knife in front of your chest. That's the secret to not getting hugged at hippie workshops. Just walk yeah. around with like a little knife, just just putting it in there. <laughs> No one hugs you, man. It's like it's a miracle how it works. Or yeah. if you can't look, like, a pair of scissors, like that'll do it. Just walk around with a pair of scissors. There. No, <laughs> right, no problem. You can still get back hugs. So you still have to be careful or slide hug, but at least the full frontal's out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. Okay. Where do people find your stuff? Where do they go on the interweb? On the interweb, they can go to exploringdeeper.com. That's my website. Or if you want to see that TED talk, you can just get my first name, get it right, get the I and the E in the right order and just Google really good TED talk. You'll find my TED talk. And uh, yeah, just find my name on all the socials. I'm everywhere. Facebook, Instagram. What's it, what's it like doing a TED talk? Years ago, I, I did a video called Better Dead Than TED. And I think that blew my chances of doing a TED talk. <laughs> It was basically why about all motivational speaking is bullshit. And um, people can still find that video, I think. But what? But I, also, it looks fun. I would totally do a TED Talk if I was invited. So what is it like? Because most of us have seen TED Talks. They, it's a lot of work. As I understand, a lot of preparation, right? You have like it's a coach. It's completely and- scripted. I, I didn't know. It's There's nothing spontaneous. It's completely scripted. So you have to like write your talk. Then a whole bunch of people is having their opinion on it. You have to rewrite it a bunch of times. And then when it's finally... Uh, Okay, then you go practice it. And on average, they say the TED people, they told me on average, people practice their speech about 60 to 70 times, which is a lot of time, <laughs> many, many times. So I've practiced it a lot. And, and even, you know, they say practice, um, practice your focus. So I would put on Netflix and the most annoying series I could find and then look at Netflix and then still do my talk. <laughs> and it worked. And then I was there and then you have to walk on stage and then people have an opinion about how you walk on the stage. <laughs> really? Like whether you strut on, whether you do a cartwheel. Yeah. Whether you... What you wear, how you move. So it's, it's, it's amazing. You have I to like, love... pick your dress, pick your shoes and then think about that. Yeah. And then people yeah. judge you. And you see the little counter goes up. How many, you know, how many hits have you got? How many, like if I went to YouTube, you know, do you look yeah, at the comments? I don't know. Last time I looked, it was over 60,000. I'm not sure what it's now. So. How do you feel about over 60,000 people having seen? I mean, they're pretty about 5,000. My, my, inner, my inner exhibitionist loves it. She is Your inner so exhibitionist happy. loves it. Oh, yeah. I'll bring it up now. <laughs> Let's see if it makes you happy. How many, how many numbers there are there on the How intimacy design, design can change your life. Feel like it's 30, 61,000 views, and it's only six months ago. Wow, you're rocking it. You're rocking it. Good Thank for you, man. You. Okay, good. Cool, cool, cool. Final message about the body before we um, wrap this one up, before we put this gimp in the, in the sauna. <laughs> I would say, like, allow yourself to enjoy pleasure. There's so much pleasure to have to be experienced to, that we can experience in our body and to just give yourself permission to find your way of experiencing that pleasure, whether it's, you know, within the paradigm or outside of it, whether it's kinky or vanilla or monogamous or non it doesn't matter, but to find your way of, of enjoying pleasure in your body. Nice. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Well. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, Yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, On the embodyfacilitated.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. There's comments on there. Um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things. So if you go to uh, put in the Embodiment Podcast into Facebook, there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on. So, um, yeah, I will reply to things personally there. So um, also on EmbodiedFacilitator.com website, 
Uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free eBooks, there's eBooks you can buy. And of course, there's our newsletter list if you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook. There, Whew, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you.